Matthew Garrett. Uh, so as an introduction, I'm a security developer at a company called CoreOS, um, but perhaps more relevantly here, I'm also a member of the board of directors of the Free Software Foundation. And I've been a, I guess I've been a free software developer for a little over 10 years. Um, I actually gave a presentation here in 2004, and it's a pleasure to come back so many years later and have the opportunity to do so again. Um, but I've also been a free software user since uh, probably the mid-90s when I had uh, very little community around me with any interest in software at all but also very little access to the internet. All I had was a CD containing the uh, source code to the Linux kernel and the source code to the GNU user space and archives of mailing lists, which allowed me to spend some time learning what free software development looked like and examining the source code to learn how people who were doing the work I was interested in doing, people who were developing free software, were writing code. I could look at what they were writing and I could learn from that. And that's what allowed me to become part of this industry. That's what allowed me to become a software developer. And so for me, free software is very important because without free software, I would not have been able to have the life that I have. So today, I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges that we face in our ability to continue using free software, but perhaps more importantly, the challenges we face in being able to use computers in a secure way, a way that's free of surveillance. And these are, I believe, issues that will be, that are already important and will be some of the most important issues that we face in the free software world for the next few years. I think these are fights that we are going to have and the people that we will be fighting against are powerful but the technologies that we will be able to make use of are complicated but worthwhile. And as we make use of these technologies, I believe that we'll be able to help protect users' rights to run software in a, to run their choice of software in a secure way. So my title has DRM in it. Um, DRM is an acronym that stands for Digital Rights Management. And this is something that people didn't really start talking about until the late 90s or early 2000s. Digital rights management is the concept of using technology to enforce rights or to control the ways that those rights are granted to people. And the question that naturally springs to mind when we talk about digital rights management is, well, whose rights? And you would love to think that in most cases, DRM is there to protect your rights. But in practice, DRM is almost always used to manage the rights of people who are not you, people who have made something and then have chosen to give you access to it, but don't want you to be able to use it in any way you wish to. Instead, DRM is often used to restrict your rights, which resulted in DRM often being called within our community digital restrictions management, something that reduced your rights. And there were plenty of examples of this. Um, the big one that we noticed early on that was a major issue in the early 2000s and late 90s was the use of DVDs. And DVDs were encumbered by DRM in order to protect the 
rights of the copyright holders. They were designed to make it difficult for you to copy the DVD, but in the process also made it difficult for you to play the DVD, except in ways that people liked. DRM meant that it was impossible for you to play DVDs on Linux for many years, and this was a big problem. But perhaps more importantly, it's obviously an inconvenience if you're not able to watch a DVD on the computer of your choice, but it's also restricted what people could use in terms of culture. It became more difficult to take snippets of footage from DVDs and incorporate those into other works. It became more difficult to make new art, new concepts that were based on what was contained within the DVD. And there is a similar situation around games consoles. Now, DVDs were designed such that it was difficult for you to play DVDs on devices that you wanted. In games consoles, DRM was used to restrict what your console would play. If you had a DVD player, you could use your DVD player to play anything you wanted. It was possible for people to produce DVDs that were not restricted and those would still play on your DVD player. It's the other way around on consoles. On a games console, the console will only play games that the console manufacturer wants you to be able to play. And in this sense, the restriction was not on what you could do with the games, the restriction was on what you could do with the hardware itself. The DRM meant that you could not write your own games and give those to friends. The DRM meant that it was impossible for you to program these devices and uh, come up with new ways of writing games, come up with new ideas about what a game should look like. And then we had what was called, at the time, TiVoization. Uh, the TiVo was a early digital video recorder. It's a device that you plugged in and then it recorded TV broadcasts onto a hard drive. And it was running a Linux kernel. It was running a GNU user space. It was running software that was released under the GPL. But users were not able to replace that software because for the first time we had a device that ran the Linux kernel, but which would only run the Linux kernel that the device manufacturer chose to give you. As a result, you could not make improvements to it. You could not fix their bugs and then run your modified kernel. This was a device that was intended to only run code that the manufacturer wanted, even if you otherwise had all the rights you needed to make modifications. So overall, DRM can be used to restrict what you use, and it can also be used to restrict how you use it. Um, DVDs, you're restricted in terms of how you can use them. Consoles, you're restricted in what you can play on them, and so on. In almost every single case, DRM has been used to protect the rights of people who are not you. And when we say rights, this is often merely a legal right, not a fundamental right. Copyright is not something that has existed for the entirety of human history. It's a construct of our legal system. When we say that we're protecting these rights, these are rights that the legal system has constructed. These are not innate human rights. So rights is, in many ways, not a good word to be using at all in the first place. Now, in contrast to DRM, we often think of free software as being completely incompatible with this. Free software is, in one sense, the freedom to run whatever you want. It's the freedom to choose which software you run and then run that on the device you want to run it on. It's the freedom to examine that software and make modifications to it. It's the freedom to run those modified versions, to give those modified versions to other people and for them to be able to run them as well. It's 
fundamentally about being able to do things. And DRM is fundamentally about the ability to deny things. And so you might think that, well, DRM is antithetical to free software, that there is no way for DRM to be part of the free software world. We're talking about free software because we believe that people should have these freedoms to modify and share and run software, and DRM exists to control those. So why are we talking about DRM in the context of free software except as something that we want to get rid of? The last few years have seen a very big change in our understanding of the world, uh, and especially around computers. Um, the people who are writing malware used to just be people who wrote viruses because it was an interesting thing to do, or they wrote viruses because they enjoyed making people's lives miserable. But these days, that's not what most malware is for. These days, viruses don't exist to just delete your data or corrupt it or print funny messages. These days, malware exists to steal your data, to insert advertising into web pages. <clears throat> these days, malware is looking for anything that looks like a credit card number and sending it back to the attacker's base. These days, malware is allowing your computer to be controlled and used to attack other people's computers. These days, malware is not something that is merely a nuisance. These days, malware is something that can be used to harm your life. And with that incentive, with these people who are becoming increasingly uh, rich and powerful through producing malware, malware is getting more complicated. Malware is becoming more devious. It's taking more advantages of systems. It used to be the case that you could merely run a straightforward virus checker that would just scan all your files and then look for anything that looked like a virus. These days, Malware can be embedded even down to the firmware of your computer. These days, it may be impossible for software to identify that your system has malware installed. And as the malware checking software gets more sophisticated, so does the malware. We're seeing cases where uh, malware now is so subtle, so carefully hidden, that sometimes Companies will identify the fact that this exists, will find out a way to notice it, and then discover that there are already millions of systems that have been infected for a very long time by this malware. But we've also discovered, as a result of revelations by, for instance, uh, Edward Snowden, that it's not just criminals who are making use of these technologies and these techniques. Governments are actively attacking users. And in some cases, these are governments attacking other governments. So for instance, the Stuxnet malware that was used to attack the Iranian nuclear program was a piece of government software. But in other cases, governments are installing software on their own citizens' computers. They're seeking to spy on what their citizens are doing. And we're no longer just having to be worried about criminals. We're having to worry about, in some cases, even our own governments attempting to install software on our computers. So if you have the freedom to run anything, if you treat that as an absolute, if freedom means you have to be able to run all software, then freedom also means having to run malware. It means not being able to restrict that. So, before, I said free software was the freedom to run whatever you want. I think there is a flip side to that. Free software is also the freedom to refuse to run whatever you want. If I don't want a specific piece of software to run on my system, free software means that I have the freedom to prevent it from running. Free software means that I can 
choose to run a piece of software and I can choose to not run another piece of software. And this is an important part of freedom. So DRM, this use of uh, these technologies that can be used to restrict what users can run, can also be used to restrict software by your choice. You can choose to use DRM technologies in such a way that your computer will not run software that you do not want to run. And recently I've been working on, in the past few years, I've been working on various technologies around this. And so I'm going to be discussing some of the background of these and ways that we can use them to protect users rather than to restrict users. Now the first thing I'm going to talk about is something called uh, UEFI Secure Boot. And this was a technology that was developed by the UEFI Forum, which is an industry group uh, made up of a large number of companies. But it's also a technology that was pushed heavily by Microsoft. And the concern when UEFI Secure Boot was originally implemented was that users would now be buying systems that were effectively DRM encumbered and which would only boot Windows. That it would no longer be possible for users to install free alternative operating systems on their computers. And thankfully, that didn't come to pass. Um, but nowadays, if you buy a modern computer, then typically it will still be configured by default to only execute bootloaders and operating systems that have a cryptographic signature that shows that the binary was created by someone in possession of a trusted key. And the set of trusted keys is inside the system firmware. When you ask the computer to boot an operating system, it will check that signature. It will verify that the signature matches one that's inside its database. And by default, the only signatures that will be trusted are ones that are created by Microsoft. Now thankfully, Microsoft um, decided to make it possible for people who aren't Microsoft to have their operating systems signed by Microsoft. So the majority of uh, free software distributions now have a bootloader that is signed by Microsoft, which is not an ideal state of affairs, but is currently working. But what if you don't trust Microsoft? Saying that your system will run anything signed by Microsoft means that any company or any government that goes to Microsoft and asks them to sign something will then have code that will execute on your computer. So thankfully, you can reconfigure your system. Um, it's possible as a user to remove the Microsoft keys from your firmware. There's an option in the firmware menu that you can get to when you turn your computer on. And you can remove the existing keys. You can remove Microsoft's keys. And instead, you can generate your own key and you can sign your bootloader with that key and then you can embed your key in the system firmware instead of the Microsoft key. And once you've done that, your system will only boot operating systems that you personally have signed. It's now possible to take a computer that you buy from a store, even if it has Windows pre-installed, and it's possible to reconfigure your firmware such that it will refuse to boot Windows. If someone attempts to install Windows on your laptop, it will fail. It will not even start. So a technology that could have been used to prevent Linux from running on systems can instead be used to prevent proprietary operating systems from running on systems instead. It's up to the user. The user has control. And this is freedom. Once you have the right to make these choices, you can say, okay, I don't want my computer to run anything unless I've explicitly said this is trustworthy. 
which means that assuming that the software is secure, assuming that there are no vulnerabilities in this, even a government is then unable to cause your computer to boot their modified operating system. It's no longer possible for them to replace your bootloader with one that they've modified, which then alters your boot chain such that your disk encryption key is recorded. It's no longer possible for the government to obtain your data that way. And it's also impossible for criminals to. So this is a way of improving user security. But like I said, the keys that are used to perform this verification are in the system firmware, the code that runs when you first turn a computer on before it starts an operating system. And if that firmware itself is not trustworthy, if that firmware has been modified such that it will behave in ways that are incompatible with your preferences, if that firmware has been modified in such a way that uh, it subverts your security, your freedom has been eroded. You may have thought that you had chosen not to run software that would harm you, but the firmware has made it possible to do so anyway. Now, a company called Hacking Team, uh, based in Italy, produced software that they sell to governments um, for monitoring citizens. It's software that can be installed on computers and then used to extract user secrets and pass them back to the government. It's software that allows governments very tight control and monitoring of people. And one of the ways that this software can be deployed is through modified firmware. They have, a hacking team had an unfortunate, well, unfortunate for them, security issue, which resulted in all their source code being leaked and published on the internet. And one of those pieces of code was code that would take system firmware, would insert malware directly into the firmware, and then allowed that firmware to be reflashed onto the system. And this firmware would then look at your operating system. And if your operating system had just been installed, if you'd taken this computer, and if you didn't trust the software that was running to begin with, so you reinstalled the operating system, it would see that your operating system was intact, that your operating system had not been compromised, and it would then copy malware into your operating system. Even if you reinstalled your system from scratch, even if you took the hard drive out, put a brand new hard drive in, and then uh, installed a new operating system, even then, your firmware would reinfect your operating system with malware. The only way you could get rid of it was to throw the computer away entirely. So firmware is not necessarily trustworthy. If someone's able to modify your firmware, then they can still subvert this secure boot process. It's possible for them to still install untrustworthy software on your system. And an example of this might be, say you take a laptop with you when you're flying to another country, and you get to the border and your laptop is taken away from you while you're being interviewed at the border. And then afterwards, your laptop's given back to you. At that point, you might think, well, they may have modified the operating system, so I'd better reinstall the operating system. But how do you check whether they've modified the firmware? That's much more difficult. You can't just reinstall your firmware. Which brings me on to the second technology that I'm going to be talking about. Um, TPMs, or Trusted Platform Modules. This was, uh, TPMs appeared in the early 2000s. They were part of an industry-wide initiative called Trusted Computing, 
And in the same way that digital rights management causes you to ask, well, whose rights? Trusted computing meant asking, who are we trusting? What is being trusted? Now, TPMs are small chips. They're not typically very powerful. They, are, they do various cryptographic operations, but they're usually quite slow. They're not things that you would use to accelerate cryptographic operations on your system. But they do something quite clever. Every part of the boot process, so when you first turn your computer on, the processor starts executing the firmware. The firmware starts executing the bootloader. The bootloader loads the kernel. The kernel then starts the init process and boots the rest of your operating system. There is this chain. And if any point in that chain is subverted, then all points after that are no longer trustworthy. So the TPM performs an operation that we call measuring. Now, measuring in this case means taking a cryptographic hash of the next stage in the boot process. So when you power in a modern system, the processor itself will take a hash of the firmware. And that value gets written into the TPM. And once that value is in the TPM, the only way you can get it out again, the only way you can reset it, is to power down the system entirely, to cut power to the TPM. Until you do that, that value cannot be reversed. It's not possible to program a new value into it, to set it to an arbitrary value. So this means that when you boot, the TPM contains a cryptographic hash of the firmware and a cryptographic hash of the bootloader and a cryptographic hash of your kernel. And those cryptographic hashes uniquely identify the code. If the code is modified in any way, those values will be different. If someone replaces your bootloader, then the cryptographic hash corresponding to your bootloader will now be a different value. If someone replaces your firmware, that cryptographic value will be a, that cryptographic value will again have changed. And the TPM supports what we call sealing. You can take a secret and you can ask the TPM to encrypt that secret. And so you now have a copy of the secret that's been encrypted by the TPM. The only way it can be decrypted is to put it back into the TPM and ask the TPM to decrypt it. But one thing you can do with the TPM is ask the TPM to only decrypt it if the cryptographic hashes are the same. If someone replaces part of your boot process, the cryptographic hashes will be different, and the TPM will now refuse to decrypt that secret. There's no way for you to decrypt it unless you're running the same firmware, the same bootloader. Well, when this technology first appeared, there were pretty legitimate concerns around it, because if you have a device in your computer that's recording what you've booted, that device can be used to attest to a third party, I'm running a specific operating system. The concern was that there would be websites that would not grant you access, that there might be software that would call out in order to obtain some kind of service and refuse to run unless you were running the right operating system, unless, for instance, you were running Windows. You might have a website that would only work if you were running a proprietary operating system that would refuse to do anything for you if you were running a free software operating system. And this was a pretty significant concern. There were good reasons for people to be afraid that TPMs would be used this way. In practice, it, this hasn't happened. Even though TPMs are relatively common, it's very difficult from a privacy perspective to uh, use remote attestation. And companies have been, because the TPM then uniquely identifies a computer. 
if you're using multiple services, it's then possible to track users. And even in the modern world where people running websites are very, very enthusiastic about collecting as much information about users as possible, the amount of information that a TPM would allow to tie to a user is so great that they don't want to do it. There are too many privacy concerns around it. So there's no infrastructure that's being deployed to make it possible for companies to do this. Uh, in practice, nobody does remote attestation except inside their own company. There are ways you can use it for security purposes inside a company, but using it in a wider scale is impractical. But also, it turns out that it's very easily circumvented. Uh, if you want to make it look like you've booted the correct operating system, the easiest way to do that is to just buy a second TPM and plug that in after you've booted and then program that to whatever values you want and then allow that TPM to attest to a remote site that you booted the correct operating system. It would be, po if this had started happening, then there'd be a market selling USB sticks with a TPM on that said, yes, I'm running Windows. And once you can do that, there's no point. You're not actually restricting your users in a useful way to you. So um, companies that were potentially interested in doing this realized that they weren't actually going to be able to gain meaningful restrictions over users as a result. So the TPM has these values, and then when your system's booted, you can look at these cryptographic hashes and you can say, okay, these are the same values that I was expecting to get. Therefore, my firmware hasn't been modified. Except we know that firmware can modify your operating system. And in that case, how do we know that the firmware hasn't modified your operating system so that it reports the correct values even if your firmware's been modified? How do we know that your operating system isn't lying to you? And I've been thinking about this for a while. And I think I've come up with an approach. So how many people use uh, two-factor authentication? Cool. So you have a piece of software on a phone or you have a small piece of hardware that prints a value and that changes over time. And then when you log in, you have to type this number in as well. Which means even if someone obtains your password, unless they also obtain this piece of hardware or the software running on your phone, they're still not able to log into your account. And this is typically implemented using a protocol called uh, TOTP, or time-based one-time passwords. There's a seed that is used, that is programmed into your device, and every 30 seconds, you take the time of day and that secret, and you use that to generate a code. And the operation you perform means that Every time the time changes, so does the value. Even if you see a number printed, you've only got a very short window of time where that number is the correct number. As time passes, the correct value changes. But while we normally use TOTP as a mechanism for proving to websites that we are in possession of a device, and therefore it's likely that we are the legitimate owner of this account. We can use TOTP in different ways. So like I said, there is a secret that is on your device that's protected. What if we took that secret and we encrypted it with the TPM on your system? What if we sealed it such that if your firmware is modified, then the cryptographic hashes are changed and the TPM refuses to decrypt that secret. 
then we know if we get the secret decrypted that the system is unmodified, that your firmware is still secure. And that way we know that if a value is printed on screen, and if the value on screen matches the value that's on your phone, then your system is uncompromised. So if we did something like this, we can print a value on the screen every time you boot, and you can then check on your phone that these values match. And in that case, for anybody to compromise your firmware, they would not only need to modify the firmware on your device, they would also need to obtain your phone and replace the secret on your phone as well. And this is much more difficult. So this is not ideal if you're crossing a border because you still have the risk that this will be intercepted. But you can also then have a phone call with someone else where you get the secret read back to you. Uh, or you can figure out some other way of getting the secret into the country and then verifying it. But it does protect you where, for instance, you leave your laptop in a hotel room. And how do you know that someone hasn't modified the firmware on your laptop while you're out of the hotel room? With this, you can. So I wrote an implementation of this, and there's code on GitHub. Uh, I'll give you a very quick demonstration of this. So you'll have to excuse me because uh, I now don't have this window on my laptop in front of me. So I run this. It generates a secret. It encrypts it with the TPM and it's sealed to the specific set of hashes that are currently in use. And then it prints this QR code. I can then take a picture of that QR code with my phone, and my phone will now be aware of that secret as well. On boot, I can then run this, and it will print a value. If that value matches the value that my phone is displaying, then my system has not been compromised. And I know that I can type in my disk decryption passphrase without having to worry about it being recorded and then sent back to a criminal organization or sent back to the government. So uh, I'm, I would like for technologies like this to start being adopted by operating systems and used to protect users. Obviously, there's a lot of integration work that has to be done, but something like this seems like a technology that is beneficial. Of course, uh, sorry. So again, there's the URL. Um, I wrote a blog post about this earlier in the week. So if you just search for TPM uh, and my name, then you will be able to find it easily enough. But this still relies upon the firmware being good. I'm, the TPM measures the firmware, but you're still relying on the firmware itself not having bugs that allow the TPM to be, that allow the firmware to be tricked into executing malware without having to modify the firmware. If you can do that, then you can still compromise the system without having compromised anything else. So this technology still relies on you being able to trust your firmware. And the problem with firmware is that despite it having a different name, firmware is actually software. And software is almost always awful. We're really bad at writing software. We have not been writing software for that long in the history of humanity, and we're not good at it. So firmware, because it's software, software contains bugs. Firmware is software, therefore firmware contains bugs. And how do we fix bugs in firmware? And this is a problem, because when you buy a computer, 
the vendor doesn't give you the source code to the firmware. You can't fix the bugs yourself. You have to wait for the vendor to fix the bug. This can take months. The average time between reporting a security issue to a vendor and them releasing a fixed version of the firmware is up to nine months. And during that time, an attacker can cause your firmware to behave inappropriately and subvert any security mechanisms you've put in place. And if the vendor doesn't want to fix the firmware, if the vendor has decided to ignore your system because it's too old, then the only choice you really have is to buy a new computer. And that's not a good choice to have to make. Thankfully, there's an alternative, at least in a subset of cases. There's uh, some code called Coreboot, uh, which is a free software implementation of system firmware. Now, the difference between Coreboot and Libreboot is that Libreboot is completely free software, whereas Coreboot is mostly free but makes use of some additional non-free setup code in some cases. So Coreboot supports more hardware, but is not entirely free. You're still trusting some vendor code, whereas Libreboot is entirely free. And using these means uh, you now do have the source code to your firmware, and you can fix security issues yourself. And this seems great, but unfortunately, it's not an entirely solved problem because there's limited hardware support. The number of laptops or desktops that you can currently run Coreboot or Libreboot on is not that large. And there's a wide range of testing required. Uh, if you are replacing system firmware, if you get it wrong, then the system stops booting. You can't just reinstall your firmware afterwards. If you want to do that, you basically need to take your system apart, potentially unsolder the flash that contains the firmware from the system motherboard, reprogram it externally, and then put it back on your motherboard. So if, say I fix, if a security bug is fixed in a new version of Coreboot, it's possible that I will then build the fixed version, flash it to my system, and then discover that my system no longer works because of a new additional bug. It's very difficult to have enough testing to ensure that this doesn't happen. So really, we need vendors to do more work here. Uh, ideally, vendors will accept that computers with free firmware are more trustworthy than computers without it, and vendors will accept that the users benefit from having free software in their firmware. But we also still need to do some additional work. Um, the security situation in Libreboot isn't ideal. There's currently no real TPM support, which means that uh, the system will boot, but will not do any of the measurement, which means we can't make use of the TPM to do firmware validation. And there's no real support for a secure boot type environment, which still allows the user to replace the keys. And being able to use your own keys is a vital part of user freedom in a secure boot environment. And of course, even if we replace the system firmware, there are still many other components on your system that are running their own firmware, almost always proprietary. And each of these components has the opportunity to subvert your security as well. And it's hard to prove that that firmware has not been modified. It's possibly the case that an attacker will be able to modify the firmware running on your hard drive, for instance. So I'll be giving a presentation on that topic at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. If anybody would like to hear more about that, then please do come along. So in summary, we can use technologies that could be used to restrict users to instead ensure that users have control over the software that's running on their system, to ensure that users can place trust in their system, to allow them to check whether or not their system's been modified. And as a result, it is possible for us to use DRM to help the cause of free software rather than harming it. Thank you. <laughs>
So I think we've got a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Oh, oh apparently we do not have any time. So uh, if people would like to just grab me outside afterwards, that would be great. Thanks. Oh, no, that's fine. No, I think that's great. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say one little thing. Mm -hmm.